Spreaker as well as YouTube. So this should be good. So we're live on two different platforms right now. Let's get it started. Hello again, fight fans, and welcome to episode 208B of the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Montero. Tonight, we're going to preview Ryan Garcia getting back in the ring with Jorge Linares. Possibly later this year, they fight uh, on the same card from Anaheim, uh, from the Honda Center Friday. And then PBC on Fox from Nashville, Caleb Plant defends his super middleweight title. And then we got some interesting news to talk about, so... uh, Phone lines are open, and I want to let you guys know, of course, we have our uh, local number here in the U.S. of A. That's 213-267-7787, and a new U.K. number. We got a London phone number for you guys over there in the U.K., 02081 So those of you over in the U.K., going a little earlier tonight, so hopefully some of you guys can call in. Starting next Monday, we're going to go even earlier so you guys in the UK can jump on. And then for you guys here in the USA, you'll probably be at work and you can listen at work. Just shut the door to your office so your boss can't see you and listen to at work. Guys, uh, as usual, as I always remind you, please spread the word about the show. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and the rest. Go live on Spreaker for the first time tonight. So we'll see how that goes. Been testing that out. We'll see how that goes on Spreaker. Uh, those of you who listen, and guys... I run the analytics reports, okay? We are getting tens of thousands of downloads so far for TNC on Spreaker. We've had tens of thousands of downloads of the show. We only have a few dozen followers on Spreaker. That is not satisfactory. If you're downloading the show on Spreaker, take the extra three seconds and follow us on Spreaker, okay? We need more followers. I got a bunch of followers, thousands of followers on so many other platforms. And for whatever reason, Spreaker just has not caught on. So I think if I start start going live on Spreaker, that might help. But I need you guys to make sure you go over there and follow us. All right. Let's jump right into this news and notes, man. Manny Pacquiao signing a deal with Paradigm Sports Management. And Pacquiao, he always makes these crazy business deals, right? He's, I think he's got like three or four managers and advisors right now. He's just got people all around him. Well, he just signed this deal as well. So the thing about this, Paradigm Sports Management also reps Conor McGregor. So as I've told you guys for a few weeks, maybe a few months by now, they are really, really pursuing a fight between Manny Pacquiao and Conor McGregor. This would be a boxing match. I have no idea what weight it would be at, but uh, Conor McGregor is definitely a bigger, stronger guy than Manny, but Manny much more aggressive than Floyd Mayweather in the ring. So that might make a fight between him and Conor McGregor interesting. I don't know, but it's very, it's looking very possible something like that could happen at some point This year, we shall see. The plot thickens with Mr. Pacquiao. And also the other news, big news of this week, Josh Warrington signs with Matchroom. Uh, I see a couple of you guys have called into the show. I know, guys, when you call into the show, you should be able to hear me. You should be able to hear the show through your phone line. So if it takes me a minute or two to get to you, just sit tight. I'll get there. I'll get to you, okay? Just let me finish up my point, and then I'll jump over to you. So if you call in and you hear me rambling, Don't worry, I see you there in the queue, and I will get to your call. Uh, Josh Warrington signs with Matchroom. Eddie Hearn is really starting to build a stable, and he has plucked several guys from uh, from Frank Warren and uh, several guys that used to be with the PBC. Uh, Interesting. It's it's very interesting, this move. Now, at first thought, you would think, oh, man, this puts a kibosh on a unification fight between Warrington and Shakur Stevenson, which both sides were pursuing. However... Bob Arum and everyone at top rank, Carl, Carl Moretti and all those guys say that this will not be a hurdle. They will still make, uh, they will still do a unification fight between the two of them this year and probably this summer. So for Matchroom, I mean, they're making moves, man. This is a big move for them. For top rank, you know, I got to talk about them. I've been telling you guys they're going to have a big 2020. They really, really are. They just signed Oscar Rivas to a contract. So now top rank has, of course, Tyson Fury, Kubrat Pulev, Carlos Takam, Jarrell Big Baby Miller, now Oscar Rivas. So they have really invested in the heavyweight division. They really, really have. 
Uh, also, Naoya Inoue and John Rael Casamero. That is official. April 25th, Las Vegas. This will unify three of the four bantamweight titles, WBA, IBF, WBO. That is a good freaking fight. Japan, Philippines, uh, three of the four titles happening in Vegas. I think that that's going to be fun, man. And, and top rank, again, these unification fights, there is definitely a pattern on that side of the house, that side of the street, I should say, where they are unifying titles in multiple divisions. And I have to talk about the New York State Athletic Commission really briefly. Uh, so I talked last week about how they really butt-raped Ivan Redcatch. They've pulled back, and they're not going to take his purse anymore. Maybe they heard some of the guys like me and others in the media bitching and moaning about their uh, punishment being too harsh. Maybe it's the fact that Ivan Redcatch had already deposited his purse in his bank account and basically told the commission, good luck getting this damn money. But either way, now they're not going to try to take his money. They just still want a $10,000 fine. And they've, less, they've uh, lessened the suspension from 12 months to six months. So that's what we got there from the New York State Athletic Commission. That was the right move. I have no issue with a $10,000 fine and a six-month suspension. It's still crazy that when you compare Ivan Redcatch to Jarrell Miller, Redcatch still 10K in six months. That's more than Miller had to face. I get it that there was a technicality there. Technically, Miller wasn't licensed by New York, but that's crazy, man. I mean, that's just a major, major issue and a flaw with New York State Athletic Commission, which is a flawed commission. I've been talking about that for a while. Let's get to a couple of your calls. Uh, We have an anonymous call here, and we'll pick this one up. Uh, Anonymous, you are on the neutral corner. What's going on? Anonymous, you there? Yo. All right. I'm going to give you a three, two, one. You're not going to get a 10 count. You're going to get a three count for me. All right. Anonymous is off the line. We have our first knockdown of the show. But we have another call real quick that we could jump to. Uh, three, two, three. You are on the neutral corner. What's going on? Hey, how's it going, Mike? It's uh, Jose Granil. What's up, man? How you doing? From uh, yeah, from uh, from LA. I'm from LA, man. Cool. How's, how's it going, man? Yeah, I used to train with uh with uh Eddie Eddie boxing Eddie Hernandez. Back yeah, in, uh, Coach in LA, Eddie's the right? man. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it going, man? How's it going? I've been watching your show for a while, man. That's Appreciate good. it, bro. I got the Dodger blue on today. What do you think about that trade they just made, man? <laughs> I don't know if that's going to help yeah, him, man. Nah, I mean, I'm not a no, nah, I'm not I'm not a big uh. I'm not a big baseball fan, oh, but okay. a right. big boxing fan, though. Cool. Yeah, well, then yeah, you're on the right I, show. Know, all my family, they all – yeah, yeah, man. Uh, how you call it? I wanted to ask you a few questions about uh, about this deal that Manny Pacquiao just, just signed. That's, you know, with the uh, same management under Conor McGregor. Do you really think that fight's going to happen realistically? They're, I can tell you that they're having serious talks, bro. I mean, both sides. And then it just – They've been having serious talks for months, and then with this signing with Paradigm, I mean, it just it's just kind of like the writing's on the wall. They definitely are trying to do something uh, between the two of them. Now, you never know. Is it going to be the two of them fighting? Yeah. Is it going to be some kind of co-promotion thing? I don't know, but I'm telling you, Pacquiao's side is interested in that fight. Conor's side is interested yeah. in that fight, and there's a lot of dollar for, signs For obvious it. reasons. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. obvious reasons, yeah. But as boxing fans, you know, and you know me, like I fought, I follow MMA and all that stuff. That's what I competed in and everything. Right. But I mean, I, I know what this is and everybody should know, even though like there's a lot of people and I, I hear you all the time. It's like, like, you know, how we take these people sound all the time and they're always saying like, oh, well, maybe Connor has a, has, has a chance, yeah. has a possible chance of beating Manny Pacquiao. And I, you know, I sit there and I just bite my tongue when I hear these things. And I'm just like, oh, my God, like they don't understand the difference between both sports and, and things like that, that there's a lot to it, you know. So how, it, how big is crazy. Connor? And, if you're an MMA guy, how, how big is Connor usually like what what weight class does he usually fight in okay. for MMA? OK, yeah, that's a that's a thing I was going to ask you next, too. I was just like, it, it's going to no. right now. Connor is floating around like he's floating around like 185 when he's not training, Shit. you know, because okay. his last fight was 170. Okay. You know? Yeah. That's what and, a couple uh, guys in the chat are saying. Yeah. 170. 
yeah, he's yeah, and so so like uh, Mike, this is this is like really weird. I think Manny Pacquiao, even though he's the A side, he would probably be the A side in this fight, probably, just because Connor is such a big superstar in in, in combat sports. I, I'm not sure how that would work out. I think, in my personal opinion, Manny would have to give up. He, he will have to move up. He will have to go like. They'll have to meet like somewhere in the middle, like 154, 156. Like a catch weight. Like All right. Yeah, like, like a uh, catch when you weight, fought Margarito something right, right. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have to. It, yeah, there's no way Connor at this point, he's like in his late 20s. There's no way he's going to be able to go all the way down to 147. There's no yeah, way. Yeah, because I'm thinking when he yeah, fought yeah, Floyd, I'm, that was 54, right? When he fought Floyd? I honestly yeah. can't remember. Yeah. Was it? Okay. Yeah, man. There's no yeah. way he's going yeah, under 154. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the last time he was around that 147, he was fighting at featherweight in the UFC. And that was a long time ago. That's when he was barely starting in the UFC, and they were barely hyping him up. Okay. And, that, and he was, like, in his early 20s. And, like, there's no way he's going to be able to go all the way down to 147 to fight Manny you know, Pacquiao. Honestly, you know, what Manny this reminds me of, man, is, like, so, so everything that you're saying is what adds kind of the intrigue to the fight because now the way they're going to market this to the MMA fans and to the casual sports oh, yeah. fans Absolutely. is, to yo, Conor yeah. lost to Floyd, yeah. but Manny's smaller. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, and man, he's yeah. older, so you know now there's a size I difference. Can see it happening, Mike. That's how they're going to promote it, dude. I'm telling you right now, that's yeah. how they're going to promote this fight. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, you, brother, you don't have to tell me. I already see it, man. The casual fans, like man, the we, we we should be working like, for these companies, bro, because we already know how yeah, they're going to promote the, this. Yeah, fight. it's going to be ridiculous. Yeah, but it's you know it's genius marketing, yeah. and then like, like I'm not saying uh, there's a good portion of the MMA fans that are. They know this. They know what this is. Most fight fans know what this is. Right. Like most fight, whether you follow MMA or boxing, they know what this is. But then there's still that little group of casual fans, whether in in, in MMA, that would still buy into it, and they'll be like, "Oh no, this he might have a chance Dude. here. He might do this because you and, know." And, and they, they are going to be happy to spend their money. Like like I've I've talked oh, yeah. to several yeah. of these guys about yeah. situations like this and you're like dude take my money and even with boxing fans i know hardcore boxing fans with that connor and floyd fight that were like dude yeah. i know this is i know what the hell this shit is i know it's basically yeah. choreographed and there's a script yeah. but i want to i want to watch the freak show i want to watch the circus so people exactly. are going to drop their money it, man that's how it works yeah and then i was uh, i mean remember that one video when you were talking about Cerrone and uh, and uh and connor yeah and you know, like, I pissed off a few of my friends because they're Connor fans, you know? And I told them, I was like, listen, man, like, in boxing standards, this this wasn't, this is not a good, this wasn't a good fight, you know? Like, there's Dude, nothing. he was coming off a first-round knockout loss. I mean, I can't, that's never yeah, happened like, yeah, in boxing. Like, yeah, and, yeah, and, and it, it's not, crazy. it was a pay-per-view. And I'm not hating on it because, again, I like I talk to friends that love MMA yeah. and they're like, dude, I don't give a shit. Cerrone, I love Cerrone and he has all these records and yeah. he's fought he's a, for so he's long. A, he's, a, he's a fan favorite. Exactly. Fan favorite. He, I would compare him. Yeah, he's a fan favorite fighter. So I can see why people were so intrigued about that. But still, like, basically, this was dude, all tailor made for Connor. You know, that fight. Like, that There's fight nothing. would be like if Errol Spence fought Robert Guerrero right now on pay per view. That's kind of the yeah, boxing equivalent. Like yeah. And yeah. not even. Yeah, but yeah, like it's kind of. And like I've tried to explain yeah. that to people. They don't care. And that's the whole point. UFC has done yeah, such it, a good job crazy. of marketing their product that the casual fan yeah. doesn't give a shit. They just don't. So, yeah. you know, boxing yeah. can yeah. learn a little a bit standard. from them. Remember when I told you in the comment? In the comment, it was just a, a standard because it, it, there's less uh, politics in, in yeah. the UFC because it's run. You know, the UFC is basically controlled, controls their fighters. It's through uh, a ranking system. And, you know, like their champions are expected to defend their belts again against the next top contender. But except like now you have, it's starting to change, starting to shift, Mike, that now you have fighters like Connor, for example, right. that are that are able to pull strings, are able to move around and and avoid certain competition and, and things like I'm telling you, this guy is so hyped up 
and he's never defended his belt, not even once. He's always been a titleist. Remember what I told you in, 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 in the comment? He's right. a titleist. And that's what I told my friends. I was like, like this guy, he, he shouldn't he, he shouldn't be a, a Hall of Famer. He will never be a Hall of Famer once if he gets – if he retires right now, he shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame at all. You know, you, can compare, you can't compare this guy to, like, John Jones, to Anderson Silva, to George St. Pierre. No, no. Right. Because those guys actually defended their belts. They cleaned out their divisions. Those guys. But I actually, I not you know, Connor, I'm not Connor. a big MMA guy, but I I liked watching Anderson Silva and I liked watching Saint Pierre. Like those were two guys that, yeah. I don't know a whole lot about wrestling and shit, but when I saw those two and their technique, I'm like, these dudes are fucking scientists. Like I actually appreciated yeah. what they did with Connor. I kind of see him being, I don't want to say a hype job. That's not the right word. And I don't want to say he's Ronda Rousey 2.0. He's not that. He's more legit than she was. But there is a little bit of marketing magic going into this thing, yeah. right? And yeah. the thing is, I'm glad you brought this up. This is a good call, dude, because I think Connor is going to be the start of a new thing with MMA where as it builds yeah. and as there's more of a history, guys like him are going to have more and more power to be able to do their yeah, own thing, which has never existed yeah. in UFC. That's never existed, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's the it's difference the between boxers – and MMA fighters, boxers yeah. have way more control yeah. over their career. Connor's that first dude that at least I've seen that really is in full control of his career. And he could tell Dana White, you know what? Fuck you. I'm doing this thing over here. And he's yeah, done it. Pretty much. Right? So yeah, he's pretty much. And I hate to say it, man. And it was something like, so you're going to see more of these uh, uh, padded records more in MMA in the next five years, you're going to start. It's seeing only natural, bro. That trend. Bro. It's, o- it's only natural. Yeah, it's yeah. part of the business. They're, they're, yeah, the thing exactly. is, yeah. boxing is learning some things that UFC is doing well, but UFC, they're learning for what boxing's done for centuries. <laughs> you exactly. know what I'm saying? So, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's weird. It's just weird because since now the two disciplines are crossing paths with these freak fights that everybody everybody's like so intrigued and watching. You know, it's just that's what that's what happened. You know, after the Mayweather and McGregor fight, it's going to happen more and more, brother. Everybody's going to know. Yeah, but, dude, I got. Um, but uh, yeah, Mike. I got a couple. Yeah. I got some more calls, bro. But dude, yeah, great no, call, no problem, man. Mike, man. All right, man. Uh, I'll call again some other day. All right, appreciate All right. it, bro. All right, thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, All brother. Right. All right, brother. All right, have a good one. Bye. All right, I'm going to grab one more call, guys, and then we're going to get to uh, to the fight preview. Let me. Uh, Looks like we got a UK caller on the line. Let me go ahead and grab this one. 797. You are on the neutral corner. What's going on? Hey, man. This is Rich calling from the UK. How you doing? Good, Rich. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, no worries. I'm taking advantage of the fact that it's uh, the show's actually on a, a kind of pretty reasonable time for us. For it's, us. I'm going to start <laughs> doing it earlier and earlier. I think uh, Monday will go on about 7 o'clock your time, 7 o'clock p.m. I think that's going to be the new sweet spot. So I want to see how that works out. Cool. Well, yeah, man, that's, uh, yeah, I'm going to be looking forward to that. I've been watching this show for a while, so it's, uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to kind of, get involved while well, I can still keep my eyes open man. <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> so uh so yeah man I just wanted to kind of talk about a couple of the things that your uh, previous caller was talking about it's uh yeah the whole Pacquiao McGregor thing is well it's just a bit of a joke really isn't it <laughs> it's it's probably going to happen yeah. too it's crazy it I'm sure it will and just like I did with the McGregor uh, Floyd fight I will snare about the whole thing and then sneakily stream it while nobody is looking <laughs> I'll be too curious not to yeah, just there was um, millions of people who but did yeah, that, so. yeah for sure I, I, I was one of them. I'm not proud of it um, you know I, 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 it was a dark time for me <laughs> but I did watch it yeah I think that, uh, it, yeah, it's, you know it, it just is what it is isn't it I mean money talks man and idiots will pay for it's the circus the circus is coming to town and you got to catch the circus that's what it is you know i get it yeah this is it this is it yeah i mean uh, the simple reality is i mean pacquiao's gonna pacquiao's gonna light him up man (laughs) that's the only thing that's gonna happen it's gonna be yeah i I quite kind of want to see it i mean mcgregor can't even hold like 10 ounce gloves up for 
three rounds, man. He's getting chin. It's going to be great. <laughs> so I probably will watch I mean, it. It would be a pretty it. epic <laughs> sight to see this um, really okay. tiny Filipino 40-year-old guy tuning up this much bigger guy in his physical prime. I mean, that would be a sight. Uh, it, it would. It, it's going to be ugly. It's going to, yeah, I mean, it really will. It's, you know, Because Mandy like, won't carry him. He's I not going to do it, Floyd. Uh, Nah, Manny. Will, I reckon Manny will do him inside three. Well, maybe not inside three because he's quite big. Inside five, I defo. I think. I mean, he's just not going to be able to live with him. Um, yeah, it's going to be brilliant. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to drink a couple of beers. It'll be great. <laughs> but you know, it, it's kind of a. It, it's sort of an extension of everything that's happening. I know. I mean, it's 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 kind of sad in a way. It's easy to it's easy to take the piss out of this whole thing, but. But a lot of the, a lot of the sort of bigger, more prime time events in boxing are, are very much like this as well. To be perfectly honest, of course. I mean, you've got some of the best fights in the world happening, like Inoue Denaire happening on a Thursday night in Japan. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it's one of the greatest fucking fights I've seen in years. That was a great I mean, fight. I, man. I, yeah, that was a great fight. Absolutely brilliant fight. But, you know, all the casual fans paying God knows how much money to see what? I mean, I don't know. To see, you know, Canelo beating up nobodies. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, picking the weakest champions in divisions and or, or not even champions in the case of, you know, super middleweight. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, we just and, try to forget about that. Yeah, it, yeah, for sure. The the mighty Rocky Fielding, you know, <laughs> what a piece of matchmaking that was. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, man. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to stay on the line for ages because there's... Oh, yeah, we got a bunch of callers. We got a bunch of UK guys on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's share the love, man. I'll, I'll, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for thinking of us and I'll listen to the rest of the show. Great. Uh, in rapt fascination. It's going to be great. All, All right. right man. Have a good night, brother. You too, Chizzy. Bye. Bye. All right, let's grab a couple more calls, guys. Oh, the UK contingent is representing tonight. Let's see. Uh, 741, you were on the neutral corner. Go ahead. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, very good. It's Lawrence calling from the UK, of course. Um, yeah, thanks very much for accommodating us. Thanks very much for having the UK number up and moving the time a bit earlier. I'm missing Love Island for this, so <laughs> oh, know, well man. worth it. The sacrifice. <laughs> um, so I had a conversation with my boxing crew. We've got a group chat. We always talk boxing. Obviously, the heavyweight division is li- alive and kicking. Mm-hmm. Um, someone said they thought Wilder would be the one out of the three main guys that ends up on top, uh, all things being said, when the when the chips fall. I completely disagree. I reckon it's more likely to be Fury um, and maybe AJ if Fury doesn't get back to his old form. Um, But Wilder seems like the most vulnerable to me of all of them, given his struggles with lesser opposition, Gerald Washington, etc., etc. Obviously, he gets the job done with the power, but I think even in the first Fury fight, he showed how limited he was. So I just wanted to know. What your thoughts was if you had to predict 2022, who's the man? 2022. Hey, it could be Daniel Dubois. Who knows? But mm. if uh, if you had to pick between the big three, here's the thing, man. You could honestly make a legitimate, logical case for any one of those three, and that's what's so fucking intriguing about it, right? So with Wilder, yeah. he's it's heavily flawed, but he's got that eraser. Of the, of the three, really, yeah. of anyone in the division. He's got the best power, but it really is just the one hand. He's, I don't recall him knocking mm. anyone out with a left hook or an uppercut. It's, it's straight right hand down the pipe. So if you can avoid that right hand, at, at some point, it's going to cost him. At some point, there's going to be a guy in there yeah. he can't clip, and he's either going to get outboxed or get caught and get knocked out himself. Can Anthony Joshua be the guy to do that? Can it be Fury? We'll find out in a week. Um but if, man, you put a gun to my head, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surprise you. I'm going to go with Anthony Joshua of those three. And here's why I'm going to say that. Mm. I know a lot of people disagree with me. Okay. But the difference with AJ, he's been beat. He's had to come back from defeat. 
he's fought better opposition. If you just look at the guys he has fought as a pro, I'm talking guys like he's about to fight Pulev, but uh, I think Joseph Parker is really underrated. Even guys like he fought Takam, he fought yeah, Dillian White once. That Dillian White victory is looking better and better over the, as Dillian White has improved uh, and proven himself. So I just yeah. I like that experience. Now, AJ has shown he could be hurt and everything else, but I just to me, experience always wins out. Always. Uh, well, I shouldn't say always. Most of the time wins out. And who knows yeah, what we're going to yeah. see between Wilder and Fury. They might wear each other out because both of those sides, they want to do three fights. So who knows how that ends up. But how I, that ends it this year. Yeah, maybe Fury will surprise us. Look, if, if Fury wins big next week, I'll be a Fury believer. Okay, I'm going to do a prediction video for Wilder Fury over the weekend. I'll post that on the channel. But I have certain opinions about how that rematch is going to go. Um, if, if Fury surprises me, and wins that fight big, I'll be a Fury believer from here on out. But right now, I just still have questions. So for me, the the it's difficult. I, I thought the first uh, Wilder-Fury fight was going to be a case where Wilder gets the better of him because Fury was still a bit fat. He hadn't been in a competitive fight for three years or whatever. And he it, it was really surprising to me that Fury was able to win by most people's estimation um, he did lose concentration. He did get caught, but ultimately he showed the levels between them two. Even though he was probably about ten pounds overweight and and really not very sharp. Um, so I, I've heard your sort of viewpoint that you know you reckon he'll get caught at some point, but I think that's possibly less likely now. I don't know trainers and stuff you've got to factor in, but less likely now than it was when they first fought. If anything. Yeah, it, it, see, that's the two sides, the, the two schools of thought on this fight. Was it that Fury wasn't completely, f- uh, I don't want to say focused, but not completely sharp for that first fight, and now he's going to be razor sharp, and he's going to avoid that right hand, won't get dropped at all, will win 116-112, something like that, 117-111. That's very mm-hmm. possible. It's also just as possible. You got, you got to think, man, going into that first fight, Fury went 12 rounds with Vladimir Klitschko. That is just great experience that he brought in confidence. He also did it on the road. He did it in Germany. So he had went in someone's backyard before Mm. and won, right? So he brought that experience and confidence into that fight with Wilder. Wilder had fought nobody. Luis Ortiz doesn't count. He hadn't fought nobody that's on Fury's level. But now going into this rematch, he's had 12 rounds with Fury. So can Wilder learn from that, and can he be sharper in this rematch? That's what I'm intrigued about. That's the, yeah, the you know what I want to see in this rematch. He's certainly learning on the job still. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's certainly learning on the job still. I, I'd I'd hope that it was it was AJ that sort of you know I'm an AJ fan, and I'd hope that he'd be the person to be at the top of the division at the end when the the, the dust settles because I like the way he's conducted his career. I like the quality of opposition that he's faced, the the fact that he's gone to unify multiple times. Mm-hmm. So I'd, ideally it would be AJ, but stylistically I just see Fury as a problem for anybody. Oh, he, he is. can just, you know, faint and jab yeah. and rack up points. And he just, he just, you know, confuses people. Wilder does have that eraser, but I think Fury showed in the first fight that if you're disciplined enough, you don't necessarily have to get caught by it because it, it was... It was crude at times the way he was. He oh, was it looked like it. an amateur at times. He looked. He looked amateur. Fury made Wilder look amateurish uh, yeah, at times. It just. But hey, man, yeah. I got it. I got a couple more calls. I got to get to. Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks very much for having me on. Thank you so much for calling, brother. Have a good night. All right. Great. Nice one. You all too. Right. See ya. All right, guys. We're gonna do a couple more calls here, then get to the uh, preview. Uh, just want to knock these calls out. Seven four nine. You are on the neutral corner. What's up? What's up, Mike? Yeah, it's uh, Sully calling from Manchester. Manchester in the house. What's up? How you doing, man? Yeah, man. I'm good, man. How are you? Doing good, good man. Good calls today. Yeah, yeah, and now, yeah, yeah. Now UK's coming out today. You know, proper. Now nah, I was just gonna ask him. I was asking, wonder about super welterweights like likes of Tony Harrison. And J Rock, uh, what do you think is next for them two? And how do you think a matchup between uh, Harris and J Rock would go? That would be a fantastic fight. And both of them are what coming off a loss. 
I don't know if it could happen. J Rock says he wants to use that rematch clause uh, to, you know, to try to right that wrong that he just had with that knockout loss in his hometown. So we'll see if that happens with Rosario. But the fight between them stylistically, I, I actually think J Rock, I, I just favor him because I think he has more levels on the inside that Harrison doesn't have. Yeah. And I just don't think Harrison would be able to rough him up the way Rosario did. Yeah. Yeah, Tony, because in the Ch- Jamal Charlo, the second Charlo fight, Harrison was nice on the inside, but he kind of just plods in. With J- and J Rock, he gets angles on the inside. Harrison exactly. more just kind of plods in, but he's got fast hands and accurate punches, but he doesn't really move when he's on the inside. With yeah, J Rock, he, does, does, he, he kind of gets him. angles on. Yeah, J, J- Rock yeah. will get his head on Tony's shoulder. Move him where he wants yeah. him, get shots off, move again. And it'll just be repeat of that over and over. And I just don't think – Harrison will win some rounds, especially early on. But once J-Rock finds his rhythm, I, I actually like him pretty decisively in that fight now that I think about it. I think – I'm not sure – because I wouldn't say they have suspect chins. I wouldn't class J-Rock as having a suspect chin. Well, but, but look at the two guys. Look at the two guys that knocked him out, though, dude. Charlo can punch like a mule at, at 54. He's explosive. Charlo's probably the hardest hitter in the division. I and Rosario's say. huge. He's a huge kid that throws yeah, tons of punches. Massive. So I, I don't know. I mean, J-Rock, if you, look, if you go back and look at that fight with Rosario, he took a lot of punches. He did. Uh, it yeah. was, you know, he no, just he got he worn down. He looks really, he looked like he gassed out almost like. Yeah. He gassed out in, in the third round. I think it was the court as well. The court got to him. I, I totally agree with that. you. That, and it, I just, you know, between you and me, and I guess everyone listening, <laughs> uh, the cut, I, I think yeah. something in that camp was different than other camps before. It's not that they took him lightly or whatever, but maybe they started too late with we, the weight cut. I don't know what it was. I feel like with J-Rock as well, I feel like he likes being the underdog. So maybe that might have got to him because he was a, like a pretty heavy favorite in that one. Yeah, I feel like he's the kind of guy who likes being the underdog. He does love being the underdog. I, you know, just uh, the interactions I've had with him and his, and his coach, uh, they very much like being on that side, coming in and everyone's writing them off. That gives them a chip on their shoulder, and they come in just with guns loaded in a different way. Uh, but, I, you know, man, a fight – I like that matchup, though, man. The more I'm thinking about it, that's a good suggestion I'm just because a, I'm just a, I'm both not coming sure what, off a loss. I'm not sure what – yeah, both quite vulnerable as well, relatively. But also, I'm not sure what what's next for Harrison though, because he's lost a herd and he's lost a chop. I, I think a herd Harrison rematch should be quite a good fight to make right now. I go herd just coming off a win. The thing, the and problem with Harrison, Harrison, honestly, Harrison. I don't know how dedicated Harrison is to. He he loves boxing, obviously. But I've heard some things from some guys in Detroit. Uh, that's my hometown, and I talked to some friends up there in the gym scene up there. Yeah. And I just don't know how dedicated he is to um, proving his legacy. It, he, he likes fighting every now and then and making money, and he's cool with that. But I don't know if he really wants to get in there and fight all these killers again. I just – look, when he won that title against uh, Charlo, he should have made demands for a hometown fight, you know um, – um, uh, I'm trying. What's the word? A voluntary defense. He didn't get one. He had to wait. He had an injury. He had to sit basically for a year before I get that rematch with Charlo. That whole thing just showed me right there. He's just a guy that's willing to kind of take orders and do what everyone says and punch in, punch out, and get his paycheck. That's I just kind of how he looks well, at it. If if he went the distance in that second Charlo fight, I would have done a lot for him. Like if he, because he's quite, he's a competitive fight. Like I had to Harrison up. Watching it live, I'd Harrison up, but I was thinking it because the way because he, he got knocked out, he got knocked out quite decisively. It's almost like, you know what I mean? If we went the distance and it was a war, close competitive fight, then he might have got more credit for it. But it's because of the fact he got knocked out, he's made it a bit more decisive. If you look at so, his career, and I've said this for a while, uh, Harrison in amateur fights, you know, five round fights, he's awesome, but he fades down the stretch. Yeah. It, it, he just slows down which is what makes that first fight between him and Charlo so interesting because he actually closed the show on that night. He's never been able to do that any other night of his career. Yeah, the first Charlo fight was quite a low-volume fight, though. I think that was why. The second, to be fair, in the second Charlo fight, he didn't look like he faded much because 
I still had him winning going into him later on. Charlo I did put too. on him a bit more. I did too. Charlo oh. uh, pressed the issue, and he just fought better. Charlo fought better in the rematch, even though he was losing on yeah, my Charlo... card. Yeah, yeah. Char... No, to be fair, Charlo proved a lot to me in that fight. He... Yeah. The way he put it on him at the end, you know, because he was... he was... I don't know if he knew he was losing the fight because uh, the judges had Charlo winning in that one. That's what he said. He the knew he was losing. About to... Gonna get... if, if you look at his yeah. body language and the way he fought at the end of that fight, he knew he was losing. Yeah. So Yeah, it showed, it showed a lot to me that he got that at the end, but... Anyway, that's all I have to say, man. Thanks for the thanks for the UK line as well, man. Right, thanks Good for calling it. Yeah, man, call. this is great. I love hearing call from you guys. Me. I know you've supported the show forever, so call in uh, on another yeah. show, bro. Yeah, man, well, man. Thank you very much, bro. Right. In a bit. Have a good day no, or a good night. In a bit. You too. All right, guys. One more call. We'll jump to real quick here. We got some great calls tonight, man. All right, um, man. I don't know what country. Uh, three five three eight. <laughs> You're on the neutral corner. <laughs> How's it going? Um, I'm from Ireland, by the way. Ireland? Oh, Mark. awesome. How's What's it? up, man? Yeah. How you doing? Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. I'm looking forward to when Conor McGregor knocks out and retires Manny Pacquiao. <laughs> Wouldn't be any more. So it's, oh, you it's heard it here first, beautiful folks. Sight. It's going to be the most beautiful sight in the history of boxing. Hey, I will, I will um, say yeah, this. Definitely. I will say this. McGregor is yeah. so much bigger, okay, and naturally stronger than Manny. Oh, my, and Manny, my, my, Manny's my, that, aggressive. My, <laughs> He could jump into a shot. You never know. I favor Manny Pacquiao to yeah. win big, but Manny could walk into a shot. He could get marquez again. And I'm telling you right now, Twitter would explode if something like that happened. Twitter might shut down from the bandwidth if that happened. He, he could get Marquez if uh, Connor knew how to actually follow through from his hip or from the back end of his foot. <laughs> but that's not going to happen. Um uh, so, um, actually, I wanted to call in something a bit unrelated, but I can kind of draw relations. Um, earlier this week, uh, I heard that Kazuto Ioka and Tanaka could possibly be fighting. And I know that could be a later topic. But it had me thinking about, in America specifically, I see a lot of like American like uh, different outlets and stuff and different rating systems. They don't, They very rarely rate fighters that aren't American and when they do it's only one or two or whatever and I was looking at Kazuto Ioki he's a four weight world champion etc you have guys like he's fought Donny Nietes he's fought he fought against uh, Romarong who holds a victory and a loss against uh, Casemiro a new way's newest opponent and I was wondering um, have have you thought about the idea that maybe there's still a very heavy American bias today because when I look at the pound for pound list I see Errol Spence in there, and I don't think that's like Josh Taylor's n not there on the ring pound for pound list specifically. I know there's multiple, but Josh Taylor's not there. Ioka, he's not there. Koso Tanaka's not there. And Taylor, he's a Unifor champion and a Ring Magazine champion. Um, Kazuto Ioka's a four weight world champion, and he's been unified in one division as well. And Kosa Tanaka is the tied fastest male fighter of all time to reach a three-way world championship status with Lomachenko. But a guy who beats an injured fighter who was coming down two weight divisions, a lightweight coming up two weight divisions, and uh, beats a dude who won a vacant belt against another dude who lost to the person who vacated the title is considered above them pound for pound. I just wanted to know why you would think that is. That's a great question. So I could tell you all three of those names. Okay. I could, I'll just speak specifically for the ring ratings committee right now. All three of those names are what we call on the bubble. And there are several people on the ratings committee that wanted to get all three of them on the list. Uh, Josh Taylor is a guy that you could absolutely make an argument for that. He should be in the top 10. I just pulled up ring magazine, our top 10 right now. I can tell you this. Okay. Um, I don't agree that Canelo Alvarez is number one. You can make an argument, but for me, my number one is either Terrence Crawford or Lomachenko. I think if Inoue destroys mm -hmm. Casimero, you got to start thinking about him. But I'm with you with Errol Spence. Mm -hmm. I think Errol Spence deserves top 10 consideration. And if you have him on the top 10, that's fine. I mean, he, he beat Brooke. He beat Porter. Those are good quality wins. Um, but are they better than what Taylor did last year? I don't know. You can make an argument. So I, I, I do think one organization that is biased 
and I've called them out, even though it's not in my best interest, the Boxing Writers Association of America, the BWA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are heavily biased toward American fighters. I mean, Floyd Mayweather could club a seal in the middle of a ring, and they'd say it's great. So I, I just – I do have an issue with some of the way they do things, okay? I don't think it's corrupt or anything like – nothing like that, but there is bias, particularly with that old – what I call – the old guard, East Coast, New York, American boxing media. It's starting to change yeah. because the Los Angeles media has taken over here in this country. And it's much more diverse. It's much younger. It's more international. And I could say this again. from the. I'm just looking at Ring's top ten. I mean, you have a Mexican, a Ukrainian, a Japanese guy, two Americans, mm-hmm. uh, another two Americans. Ukrainian, a Kazakh, another Mexican, a Russian and a Filipino. So that's pretty international. I mean, our, I think that um, oh, yeah. the little guys should get more love. I agree with you. The two little Japanese guys. The one thing I'd like to see from them is a unification fight. Once that happens, boom, they're there. Uh, but well, dude, good, good question. A good point. I agree with you on a lot of that. I do. The one thing, like, when I'm looking at that, Spence is, I'm not looking at the list right now, but off head, I think he's number six or seven. He's six, yeah. Um, I'm looking right now, he's number six. He's number six. And number ten is Pacquiao. And Spence's last victory is over Sean Porter, who beat Danny Garcia for the belt. But Bo- Keith Thurman beat Bo Porter and Garcia. That's a great paper. point. And Pacquiao beat him. And Pacquiao's three places below him. And that's where that comes into it, where I'm looking at it. Is there still a bias in terms of trying to be able to grow the sport to some extent? Because America's where the main market has always been. And you need to have two Americans on it. Like, you go through the Ring Magazine fighters of the year throughout the history. Like, there was decades where they just clean sweeped it, bar one or two people. Like, even through the 80s and 70s, like, only the Ram was even a mention. Right. Well, uh, and now we are seeing a change. Like we have, we only had one Ring Magazine fighter of the year uh, in the last decade. Only one ward, 2011. Um, and where where we are here is, I think we're in like a precipice where we are trying to see change. But there's still, if an American has somewhat of a credible resume, he's going to be rated above guys who are lower down on the totem pole, even if they have a stronger resume or criteria to be considered. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think that I think that's a fair argument. I really do. I'm trying to think if there are any instances where that wasn't necessarily the case, and I'm struggling to find an example right now. I will say with your Spence and Pacquiao example, the one thing about Pacquiao beating Thurman, I agree with you. I mean, it's kind of a triangle theory, but him beating Thurman is probably more impressive than Spence beating Porter, right? But when you factor in that, how how often has Keith Thurman fought in the last three years? Once or twice? He's had injuries and layoffs, multiple injuries, I think a car accident. So when you factor all that in, I think that's why some people on the ratings committee were thinking, you know what, we shouldn't just throw Pacquiao right back in at number five or six. He beat a guy who's a semi-retired fighter. I think that was the the feeling. That was the conversation we had uh, back and forth. But if if, if honestly – Taylor could be right there in that position. I'm just looking, though, at the list. Mm-hmm. Alvarez, Lomachenko, Inoue, Crawford, Usyk, Spence, Golovkin, Estrada. I think Estrada's too low. Better be of, and then Pacquiao. Who do you take out of there and put Taylor in? Maybe it's Spence if he doesn't fight this year. Then I agree with you. I, re- I, remove, I remove Errol. I remove Errol. I, I, me personally, on that list, I would remove Errol, and I would remove Arthur. And I would put in Kazuto Ioka, and I would put in Taylor. Those and, would be the two. And, you know, I wouldn't argue with you. The The only thing with Baturbiev, you know, undefeated as a pro, every one of his wins is a knockout. And the way he broke mm-hmm. down Alexander Vosdick to unify those titles, I mean, he might be – I think he's probably underrated and underappreciated because Vosdick's a I love stylist. Yeah. I love him. He's my favorite fighter to actually just watch because he's so brutal, he's so mechanical, it's just robust. Whereas with Vosdick, 
the thing with me with Vostick is I feel he was still he's a fighter who was still affected. Like you talk about semi retired. I think his head was semi out of the game after the Stevenson effect because he was pulling quite a few of his shots against Paterbiev, whereas against Stevenson, he was putting more emphasis on them. Maybe it was Paterbiev's power. I think it was Paterbiev's power, effect. yeah. Against Stevenson, Stevenson Could was be one of the done. other theory. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. A great call, um, man. If anybody could, if anybody could who hasn't, hit the like button. Have a good <laughs> peace. Thank you, my man. Have a good night. All right, guys, great freaking calls tonight, man. Great freaking calls. All right, let's get into this fight preview real quick, and maybe we'll take a few more calls tonight. Uh, Awesome, man. I'm already realizing I should have made this show earlier uh, than it's been. Uh, It's already paying off. Um, Pietro with the super chat. What are you saying there, Pietro? He says, Mike, tell Tommy I love him. (laughs) Tommy, Pietro loves you, bro. And then we had a super chat earlier from Florian who said, glad to see you live at this time in Switzerland, mate. Cheers, brother. Manny just following Floyd's footsteps as we've seen before. Love the podcast, bro. Guys, thank you so much for the super chats and for the awesome calls. All right, so as I was saying, uh, Friday, February 14th, there actually there's a showbox card from Philly that's on, but the big card Friday is from Anaheim, California. Golden Boy Promotions on the zone. Ryan Kingry Garcia going up against Nicaragua native Francisco Fonseca. This is a 12-round lightweight fight. Fonseca is a natural 130, moving up in weight. KO8 loss to Javante Davis and a unanimous decision loss in a 10-rounder against Tevin Farmer. So Garcia has said in several interviews, this is his way of kind of using this as a measuring stick to see if he could outdo what Javante Davis did and Tevin Farmer. And he's been calling out Javante Davis a lot lately. I think, you know, look, if that fight was made a year or two ago, I thought Davis would have just walked all over him. If that fight's made now at 135, that's a hell of a damn fight that I'd love to see. Also on this card, Jorge Linares fighting Mexican-born Carlos Morales, who who himself had a close fight with Kingry back in 2018, almost beat Garcia when they fought in 2018. That was right before Garcia went over and started training with the Reynosos. Golden Boy and Garcia's, to their credit, after that close fight with Carlos Morales, they said, look, we got to change something here. And they put him in camp with the Reynosos, and Garcia has looked better since. If Garcia and Linares win these fights, the two of them very possibly will fight on the probably the co-main of Canelo's fight in May, which would be a good co-main. That would be a really, really good co-feature to that. Whoever the hell Canelo finally fights, they need to make a freaking decision over there. Also, Blair, the Flair Cobbs, 147-pound prospect, and fellow welterweight prospect Alexis Rocha on this card. And Saturday, February 15th, from the Bridgestone Arena in Nashville, PBC on Fox. This is from TGB Promotions. Uh, Caleb, there was going to be two Calebs on this card. Caleb Truax is off the show, though, because his opponent withdrew, so that's not happening. But Caleb Plant is still in the main event, going up against... German Vincent Feigen, Feigenbutz. Feigenbutz. Am I saying that right, guys? Any Germans on the a, on a line here? Uh, German words are fun to say, but I can't speak any German word calmly. It just feels like every German word is Rauschenschlagen, Guggenschlagen, Volkswagen. It just feels so such an aggressive language. Anyway, uh, second defense of Plant's IBF super middleweight title. He is 19-0 with 11 knockouts. He should win this fight, and he should win it huge, right? This is going to be a big knockout win for him in front of his hometown crowd. Uh, Feigen Boots is from Germany. Zero amateur experience. Zero amateur fights. Went pro in 2011 at 16 years old. Has done his learning on the job as a pro. Should Plant win this fight, and he should, and he should win it big. It is time for him to step up. He fought Jose, who was caught the guy to win the title last year. Cool. First defense was against Mike Lee. Okay. That's a brand building thing, I guess. Whatever. You beat the guy in all the subway ads. Cool. Now this fight against Feigen Boots in Nashville. Homecoming fight. Cool. Bro, you've had your homecoming. You've had your voluntary defense. Now it's time to step it up and unify titles. David Benavidez has one of those other titles there at super middleweight and he is also at pbc we need a caleb plant david benavidez fight by the end of this year if caleb plant does not call out 
by name, David Benavides or one of the other top super middleweights in the world after blowing out five on boots Saturday night. Shame on him. All right. Also on this card, Ruche Warren, former Bantamweight titleist, going up against uh, Mexican native Gilberto Mendoza, who has an extremely weak resume. Warren can't punch through a wet paper bag. Honestly, Tiffany, my fiance, punches harder. I'm not saying this to be disrespectful. But it's just the truth. I've taught her how to, you know, punch through a target. She punches harder than Ruche Warren. Warren is a fantastic fighter out of Ohio. Uh, was on, I think, three Olympic teams. Hundreds of amateur fights, several seasons with the World Series of Boxing, but just has absolutely zero power. He makes Pauli Malignaggi look like George Foreman, and that has cost him. However, with his boxing skills, he is going to absolutely dance around Mendoza and win this fight. Bryant Porella out of Florida going up against Arizona native Abel Ramos in a crossroads welterweight fight. Uh, Porella fought one top welterweight, and it was Jordanus Ugas. He was stopped in four rounds back in 2016. Ramos fought two top super lightweights. He's really a 140 who's moved up to 147. He was stopped by Regis Prograde 8, and he lost a unanimous decision to Ivan Baranchek back in 2017. So the loser of this fight probably going to fade out and become that journeyman-level guy. The winner of this fight may work themselves into some sort of mandatory situation down the road. Good crossroads fight just because of where these guys are at in their career, just in terms of matchmaking, this fight probably going to steal the show. I'm telling you right now, has a chance to steal the show. Austin Dulé, Southpaw, prospect out of Nashville, going up against Diego Magdaleno, Southpaw out of Vegas, who has fought for, I think, two world titles and come up just a little short. Dulé's only loss was to fellow prospect Chris Colbert, blue chip prospect, Chris Colbert back in 2018. Colbert stopped him a couple years back. So for Dulé, uh, he is a Nashville native. Going up against his most experienced opponent. Let's see what he could do. Uh, Magdaleno coming off a KO7 loss to Tiafima Lopez last February. So yeah, he challenged for world titles at 130 and 135. I believe this will be a, a 135 fight. So has Dulé learned anything from that loss to Chris Colbert? We shall see. All right, uh, we got another call here on the line. That is it for the preview, guys. Let's jump over to this call. Uh, 512, you are on the neutral corner. Go. 512. Hello? Yes. Hello? Hello. I'm sorry, I was trying to watch a show while looking at my laptop in my car. I just got out of the gym, and my hotspot isn't really working that well. What's up, Mike? What's up, man? Having a good show, Nothing man. Lots of good calls to tonight. Good. Would you work out tonight? Uh, I just, just um, did some upper body work. That's cool. I did my road work earlier, and now after the show tonight, after dinner, I'm going to go get my back and buys in. Tomorrow's my second leg day of the week, so that's going to fucking suck. <laughs> what you got for the show, man? Uh, well, I just got some few questions, but... What I'm most excited about is the end of this month. I'm planning on going to the uh, the Mikey Garcia Jesse Vargas card live. I'm real excited for it. It's my first um, boxing show that I'm going to go to in person, so can't wait. Dude, that's going to be a good show. That's a stacked card, and there is a real uh, growing boxing community in Texas. That's going to be the next hotbed, and I wouldn't be surprised if Texas overtakes New York as far as boxing markets in the next 20 years, it's going to be LA number one, LA and Vegas. And then Texas is going to be number two and New York's going to be number three. I'm telling you, there's more and more fighters coming out of that area. And with the Mexican American fans there and everything, I just think uh, Texas is great, man. I always have fun when I go down there. You're going to have a blast at that fight. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, Errol Spence is there, the Charlo brothers. I mean, there's a lot of, Oh, you can't also forget Alberto Ortiz too. Hell yeah. He's going to be a huge star in these next few years. Yeah, he's going to, at some point, he's going to have a, a huge fight there in Dallas at uh, Cowboys Stadium. I was at AT&T Stadium. And it just, if they get it right, if Golden Boy gets it right, and he ends up fighting either Cinco de Mayo or Mexican Independence Day at AT&T Stadium, that's going to be a huge event. I, I really hope that um, Virgil Ortiz doesn't just, once he hits that certain level, doesn't just fight in Vegas. 
and keeps coming back to Dallas because that's such a growing market, man. I agree with you. It just really sucks that Oscar De La Hoya isn't promoting him as much compared to like Ryan Garcia. Honestly, I, I'd say that Virgil Ortiz has more potential than Ryan Garcia. I mean, I could see this dude. And I remember you saying, and I agree with you. He's, he's going to go up to 160 eventually. He's going to get too big for 147 and 154. I mean, he's he's pretty young. Yeah, he's and he's got he's got the frame for it. If you've seen him up close, he's going to fill in very well. And I think yeah, he's gonna. He's going to – I don't know if he can win a title at 47 because I'm just thinking from a promotional perspective, you know, everyone's on the other side of the street. But I think at one point he could work himself into a mandatory, right, and maybe get a title at 47. But I think at 54 he's going to destroy that division. When he f- kind of gets into his mid-20s, I think he's going to own that division and then eventually go to middleweight. He's going to have a great career, man. He's got the mentality for it. You I- know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's kind of hard. I mean, that's what I don't like about boxing politics. It's just too strong in this sport. He's going to have a hard time getting a title in 47. I mean, if you think about a pro grade, Taylor, and probably his uh, stable mate, um, Jose Ramirez, is going to jump up there to 147. It's going to be hard for him. Yeah, those guys are going to go up to 47, and, you know, top rank is going to you know, try to make fights between them and Terrence Crawford. That's the the direction they're going to go. And then PBC is with everybody else. So the best thing Virgil Ortiz could do when he gets up to 47 is to try to work himself into a mandatory position. And at some point he'll get a title shot there. But, you know, I, I think for right now, this next opponent is kind of a step back for him, but, uh, it's going to be tough at 47, but take some time, Fight a few guys. Fill into that weight. Don't rush it. If you don't get the title shot at 47, who cares? Just develop, fill into that weight, and then go up to 54 and go for one of those titles. Because I think that's where he's really going to make his mark. Oh, yeah, for sure. I totally agree with you. Another question I have is, if Ryan Garcia, after when he beats his his opponent on Friday, and he ends up fighting Jorge Linares, and he – stops him in brilliant fashion. Do you think he'll be able to beat Jermonte Tank Davis? Yeah, I, I think um, that's going to be a huge test. I mean, first, let's see what he does against Fonseca. If, if he blasts him out in, let's say, the first half of the fight, that's a statement. And then if he can go from that and fight Linares and stop him. Now, a lot of people have stopped Linares, you know, but he's, he's also stopped a lot of people. He's very dangerous. If he could blow through those two guys – I think that's a massive statement, and his stock will be higher than Javante Davis. Mayweather Promotions and PBC, they're trying to make it seem like Javante Davis is this massive star who's ready for pay-per-view. The numbers don't necessarily reflect that. He does sell tickets. He he sells a lot of tickets, but I don't know if he's ready for pay-per-view. He's going to need a big opponent. And, man, I, I would love the end of this year if we got Tank Davis and Ryan Garcia, if they had to go pay-per-view to make it happen, so be it. That's a big fight. That's, and a winner of that becomes a star. You know what I'm saying? So I'd love to see that. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I remember Gervonta Tank Davis sending a tweet to Josh Taylor saying he wanted to fight him. I just think he's not that good enough to fight Taylor. I think Taylor would, like, destroy him, to be honest. Yeah, I think if you saw what Taylor did with Progre, and Progre is a stronger, more rugged – version of tank davis tank davis is explosive but he's not as tall and rangy as pro gray pro gray himself isn't that tall but i mean i'm just you know when you compare pro gray's taller and everything than davis and then or i'm sorry pro gray's taller than davis and taylor is so much bigger than pro gray i just yeah the the size difference there i think taylor would actually murk him because taylor has that mean streak and he showed that against pro gray i think he could really just kind of out bully Tank Davis in that fight. I think he could knock him out cold, seeing what he did against Ivan Baranchek. I mean, I thought Baranchek would give Josh Taylor a heck of a ton of trouble, which he did, though, but I didn't think Taylor was going to drop him twice. I mean, yeah. I was very surprised how, you know, how strong he was because I didn't think much of Taylor, to be honest. I thought he'd be some B-level boxer, but now, like, he's a pound-for-pound-level dude. 
like that. Yeah, he really he showed an extra team. level, and it took having tough moments with Baranchek for him to reveal that. You know what I'm saying? And then against Progray, that was a oh, really yeah. close fight. It took those two really tough fights. Sometimes you you need that challenge to see if 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 a fighter has that extra dimension. And it really it appears that Taylor has it. He's had some issues out of the ring. He needs to clean that shit up and be more disciplined because he could ruin his career if he parties too much. But if he cleans that stuff up, he, he's going to have a good career, man. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that Texas Baranchek really helped him with pro grade. If he hadn't fought Baranchek, in my opinion, I think, oh, yeah. I think that fight with pro grade would have gone real south. I totally agree with you, and you—that's why you need that type of fight. It's like Tiafimo Lopez is about to fight Lomachenko, and he had a tough fight a couple of fights back against that Japanese dude. I can't remember his last name, but that's going to help him. I believe. Yeah, there you go, Nakatani. That's going to help him against Lomachenko. Now, I still favor Lomachenko, but had Lopez never had, never like been tested like that, Lomachenko would have just destroyed him. Now, dude, that's a competitive fight that's going 12 rounds. Uh, that's going to be a yeah, tough for fight sure. for Lomachenko. For sure. So, you know, guys yeah, need I that. I mean, I've never – yeah, I've never seen a six-foot-tall Japanese lightweight before. I mean, yeah. that's crazy. I mean, he's at six foot making 135. I mean, how, how the heck do you do that? That's it's crazy, crazy, man. Uh, it reminds me, there's uh, Ali Fonico is a guy who used to – I think he was like six feet. He was out, out of South Africa. He, he made 130. Uh, Diego Corrales was a tall guy for, for 130, 135, I think you fought that. Uh, so you just see that sometimes. Some of these dudes are skinny as hell, never lift weights, just do road work. It's smart. It's real smart, you know. Uh, lifting weights and everything, not always the best thing for a boxer putting on that bulk. Sometimes it's better to just be that tall, skinny, sure. rangy dude, you know. Yeah, Anthony Joshua comes into mind. I mean – I mean, man, like 250, I mean, he looked real bulky, but he, he looked so sluggish. Like, he looked really, he looked robotic, like a lot of people were saying. But now after his rematch with Andy Ruiz, I mean, he looks a lot better. I think he'll be much better from now on if he, kept, if he keeps on training like he did for the rematch. Yeah, that loss is, is going to make him a better fighter. I think too many people are writing him off, man. It's like, look at... Vladimir Klitschko, look at Lennox Lewis, look at Evander Holyfield, guys who lost fights, sometimes losing against guys they should have never lost to, right? Uh, but they came back so much stronger because of it. So I think that um, I think Joshua has a good chance to be one of those guys. He's just got to stay focused. It's hard, man, because, dude, he's like I, the most famous athlete in the U.K. right now. He's certainly in the top two or three. So it's oh hard. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. I mean, that guy packs like 90,000 people at Wembley Stadium. I mean, he, he could be the most popular in the U.K., and I think he's the best heavyweight. A lot of my coworkers think that Deontay Ward or Tyson Fury are the number one, but I think A.J. is based off of his resume. He's definitely the, got the best resume. The lack of fight compared to the other two, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he fought Andy Ruiz twice, Vladimir Klitschko when he was 17-0. and I mean, Joseph Parker, Alexander Povetkin, I mean – he fought all those guys back to back. Dude, Dillian White, look at the top 10 of the heavyweight division. He's fought like half of them. So you, you got to give the guy credit. Now, you know, sometimes people criticize the way he fought in the rematch against Ruiz, which I think is crazy. Um, they make it seem like he fought like Guillermo Rigondeaux. He didn't do that. He, I thought he boxed really, really well. Oh my gosh. And he showed another level that he could take with him in fights against Wilder, Fury, whoever it is. So, man, I got uh, I got other calls I got to get to, bro. Um, I appreciate you calling into the show, and uh, oh, thank you. Do it again, man. It was a great call, dude. Oh, for sure. All right. Oh, by the way, good luck tonight, man. All right, brother. Thanks, man. All right. You have a good day. All right, you too. All right. Let's see here. We're gonna take. Uh, you know, we're gonna do one more call here, and then we're gonna drop off, guys. We got. Uh, let's see. Oh. Five eight five. You're on the neutral corner. Last caller of the night. What's going on? Hey, what's going on, Mike? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me on the call. I'm gonna uh, make this real quick. I'm a big fan of yours, man. Uh, I just want to ask you um, for this fight, Wilder and Fury. 
Uh, who can, and obviously no one can afford a loss, but, you know, a loss won't hurt too much when you find the best. But for a loss, if Wilder loses, does it hurt him more or does it hurt uh, Fury more? You know, that, that's a great question, bro. Um, I, You know, I, I think it hurts Wilder more, and here's why I'll say it. Because American fans are obsessed with this O shit. Having an O, I think, is more of an American fan thing. Because over in the UK, we've seen fighters over there lose, and they still have huge fan bases. Like, I remember when Ricky Hatton lost to Floyd Mayweather. They were both undefeated, right? Dude, minutes after Ricky right. Hatton got knocked out. Remember, he got knocked. Floyd hit him with that beautiful check hook, and uh, Hatton's head hit the ring post, fell down. Dude, minutes later, the British fans right there in Vegas were singing that there's only one Ricky Hatton song. After the knockout, they were still partying. So I think if Fury lost, he could still – He's st- not that he's a huge star in the U.K., but I just think the U.K. fans are more forgiving of a loss, it seems. For Deontay having that O, oh, I think that's bigger for him. That's just the way I see it. Yeah, that, yeah that's true because a lot of my um, my coworkers, they're basically saying, oh, Wilder can't lose, Wilder can't lose. And I'm telling I'm trying to explain to them, he can lose. I mean, I, I mean – if you fight the best, you continue continue to fight the best. Eventually, someone's gonna get you. You know, exactly. so I'm, I don't nothing wrong with Wilder losing. I just want to see Wilder improve. If he loses, if he learns from the loss, like I feel AJ did, I exactly. don't think it hurts him. So that's dude. I, that's honestly, exactly where Wilder. I was going. That's that's such a smart thing I'm to a, say because that's exactly it. <laughs> AJ got better from a loss. Wilder could too. Yeah, I'm a huge Wilder fan, but I'm not one of them guys that is not realistic or just Wilder, Wilder, Wilder. I thought Fury won the first fight. I had Fury winning the uh, first fight, and this fight I think is 50-50 again, and I'm kind of leaning towards Fury, but I'm hoping Wilder wins it because I want to see Wilder and Joshua. But I just hope at the end of the day I hope it's a great fight, and um, thanks for taking my call, buddy. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Yeah, good call, man. Guys, awesome calls tonight, man. I I think he brings up a great point, again, with the AJ thing. AJ losing to Andy Ruiz, he's still the most popular boxer, probably the most popular athlete in the UK. It didn't hurt his brand at all. In fact, there's probably a lot of fans out there that like him even more now, right? So it's not about necessarily – Um, how you lose, it's how you come back from it. And if, let's say, Wilder Fury, the rematch next week, and of course, we'll talk about it next week on the show, but if Wilder loses a unanimous decision to Fury, and let's just say, let's just speculate, okay? Let's say he makes a change in camp. He brings in another trainer or something like that and starts to really focus on different things and starts to focus more on boxing and balance and straighter punches, more fundamental boxing, angles, spacing, all the stuff that he fucks up a lot because he gets away with it because of his power. If he does that and then comes back in the rubber match in the third fight and wins it, I think it makes Wilder not only a better fighter, but probably it, it builds his brand more. So, And the same thing goes for Fury. If Fury loses this fight, the, I think the only way a, a loss could really – really change their brand is if there's a second round knockout. Like if Wilder just one hit or quitters Fury in the second round or something, or does them like he did Dominic Brazil, that would be devastating for Fury's brand. That would be really bad. I don't see that happening. I think this fight's probably going to go the distance, but we'll talk more about that next week. Guys, awesome freaking show, man. Awesome show. Love the calls tonight. Uh, we're going to jump off here. Re- please remember to uh, get over to Spreaker. And make sure you follow us there. We're going to start going live um, on there as well as YouTube. So for those of you who can't watch on YouTube live, you can listen on Spreaker live now, okay? One uh, last super chat from Pietro. Thank you so much, my man. He says, Fury all the way, two-time world champion. Look, man, if Fury pulls that off, that's huge. It's huge. I just think um, if he can avoid that right hand for 12 rounds, I don't. that's the part where I don't know if Deontay can recover. If he could go a full 12 rounds without being able to catch Tyson Fury and gets, like, outclassed, outboxed and loses, like, 
10 rounds to two or something, that's going to be hard to come back from. All right, guys, uh, have a good weekend. Enjoy your Valentine's Day. Be safe, and uh, we'll do it again Monday. And, again, next week we will have the um, – the uh, Fury Wilder 2 prediction video, all right? So, uh, yeah, we'll see you at the fights.